It is our sincere pleasure to, to invite Deborah back to be with us on campus. Deborah Garcia is a designer, storyteller, and educator. She holds a Master's of Architecture from Princeton University and a Bachelor of Architecture from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. She was a recipient of the Princeton University Butler Traveling Fellowship, which took her to the corporate agricultural complex of the United States heartland, not so dissimilar to our environs. Although in her case, she specifically ended up as a resident at Art Farm, Nebraska, and was an invited participant to the 2019 Arctic Circle Expedition in the international territory of Svalbard, Norway. She was a co-curator of the drawing show at the A Plus D Architecture and Design Museum in 2017 and curator of One Night Stand for Art and Architecture LA in 2016. She was the Marion Mahoney Emerging Practitioner Fellow at MIT Department of Architecture and currently teaches at the Yale School of Architecture. She's currently designing, wiring, soldering, testing, and experimenting with the integration of sound technologies into modes of architectural representation and space making. She is an explorer chasing and discovering ways of making space in the world, actively looking to create new imaginaries and develop her ability to, to craft escape plans from colonial fantasy futures. I personally first encountered Deborah's work um, in Columbus, Indiana, which is only about two and a half hours from here. I think some of you also encountered her work there, um, specifically in the courtyard of, or the sunken courtyard, that is, of I.M. Pei's uh, brutalist library at the center of town uh, where she brought the library's voice to life as you'll see tonight. She'll be presenting about loud speaking architectures, um, research and practice uh, that explores sonic architectures. From a singing warehouse to the exhalations of that library, Deborah will present a series of architectural stories that focus on our sensory and aural relationships to the built environment, pushing our senses and conceptions to higher and often surreal levels of hypersensitive listening. Help me welcome Deborah Garcia. All right, hi. Um, thank you so much for the incredible introduction, Joseph, and Thank you um, for the invitation to join you here today. Um, landing and then waking up this morning and going outside the door into 60 degree weather is the like the greatest welcome I think that I could have had in this in this cold long winter. Um, but again, I completely understand the competition between sitting in a lecture space or being outside in the beautiful weather. So. I mean, there's that um, competition today. <laughs> um, I'm super excited to join you all here today. Uh, I am going to sort of oscillate throughout this talk into describing a couple projects that have been sort of longer term research, some new projects, some sneak peeks, some projects that are sort of more experiments and less proper kind of uh, architectural projects, but really just starting from a place of thinking about sound and thinking about life. And, you know, I love the theme, building affinities. I think I've been sort of pondering on this for a, a little while now since we, um, since I got the invitation. And I feel like, uh, you know, this term in some ways works really well with the work that you're going to see today. I think it's about buildings and it might be about the things that buildings love and the things that we can listen to when we listen to what buildings love. Um, but it also is the verb of um, building affinities, developing love, constructing love and thinking about, about the way that we love architecture and don't love architecture because also fundamentally understanding the things that we don't love and imagining the ways that we could change those things and working towards that change is maybe the greatest act of love that we could have, um, especially now. So um, I think maybe throughout today in the talk, pondering on, on love maybe is an invitation um, for me as much as for you. Um, maybe in that, in that energy we can, we can start today. Um, 
So I'm going to start with this term loud speaking architecture and maybe to dive into loud speakers and, and sound and, and um, kind of sonic experience, I want to start maybe just pondering life and thinking about how we describe life, what do we think life even is. And you know, we, we kind of move quickly, incessantly as human beings, we move through life as if to prove with this great and wriggling fervor that life lived is a life of zigzagging, efficient and non-efficient movements full of expression. Um, and beyond our bodies, all of this unfurling, crawling world of things. Behold the writhing evidence of life. Death comes quite simply when things cease moving. Death or worse. Life, death, and whatever else, all in the digital age have become unstable states with fluctuating definitions. And most importantly, um, we can think about this movement of the body, right? If we go back to Plato, the idea that self-movement or movement is a definition of life. Um, that very idea that movement is a marker of life has completely been erased or eradicated in the digital age. Um, in the digital age, we have become, we have entered and become unstable states with fluctuating definitions, and more importantly, movement of the body is no longer an adequate action by which to determine human from non-human, animate from inanimate, sentient from automated. From the walking dead to the programmed instrument, the contemporary definition of what makes a thing lively or quote unquote alive is blurry. And so the first part of this lecture is going to start with um, thinking about robots and robot faces and automated sound machines. And we're going to start from maybe something that's going to feel very left field, but I promise you, come with me on this ride and we're going to, you know, find our way back to architecture. <laughs> um, so I want to start with, with robots, robot faces. Um, the human made, the manufactured humanoid is a place to start. The humanoid is fashioned by careful and mysterious means. Um, it cannot be reduced to the spontaneity of other forms of creation. It's constructed, not conceived. The humanoid enters the world through technique and is filled with coursing energies harnessed by precise mastery, then employed to produce lifeness. The resulting human-made humanoid is oblivious to its artificiality and it's driven by instincts outside of itself, the instincts of a master, a body without a soul. For tonight, let's call that soul, um, you know, a kind of, of energy. Um, maybe, uh, you know, not necessarily to sort of get into the, the questions necessarily of what is the sort of life that animates a robot or a, a kind of cyborg, but thinking much more about um, lifeness, right? And the soul as maybe we could say the soul is energy. Um, a kind of substance that while it cannot be harnessed does in fact have agency on the world. And on the extremes of mythology and science and especially science fiction, it's an energy used to imitate life. It's important to distinguish between imitation and simulation, where imitation might also be regarded as a kind of miming of lifelike actions. The character of the humanoid is not simply a copying machine, but rather finds itself as a machine copied or is a constructed double. The humanoid is carefully made, but not controlled through, its, through to its purpose, or at least not thoroughly. Belonging to a long line of experiments, the humanoid is most interesting at its moment of failure. If Frankenstein's monster had simply been the story of a modern day defibrillation, it would surely not have become the cornerstone of horror. The story of Frankenstein's monster is interesting to us precisely for its monstrosity of both resulting creature and relentless creator. The, re the reanimation of the dead holds incredible narrative power, rising from its gruesome images, severed limbs, rotting flesh, and then upon resurrection, a faltering half-life. The zombie gives itself away by its drag dragging limbs, the golem because of its gargantuan shape and size, and even when not undead, the same rules apply. The replicant lacks human emotion, and even the best and most well-designed of androids finds its demise at the hands of an undeniable artificiality. That is, of course, until it doesn't. And then the line between artificial and real is not only blurred, but turned against us, 
the humans, presumably, you know, all of us here are humans. But I want to start from this place of thinking about lifeness, the things that, that imitate life and the things that convince us that something is alive, right? Um, I want to uh, hearken now to a, to a film and to think, um, you know, in 1921, Karl Meyer and Hans Janowitz sat in a Berlin cinema enraptured by a sideshow titled Man or Machine, in which a strong man, when hypnotized, would perform incredible acts of supernatural strength while delivering cryptic and foreboding messages to his enthralled audience. That very night, the two men would begin work on a film that was to become The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. In Caligari, we open with the small town of Halvensal, in which a fair has arrived, bringing with it a merry-go-round and festivities, as well as a sinister character, the malicious Dr. Caligari. We are soon introduced to his traveling exhibit of the entranced sonambulist, Cesare, or Cesar, a man who has been sleeping day and night for 23 years and is kept in a coffin-like cabinet. With great theatricality, Dr. Caligari calls him on stage. Shazar, do you hear me? It is I calling you. I, Caligari, your master. Awaken for a brief while from your dark night. Shazar's lips begin to twitch, his face convulses violently, and he's brought forth from the throes of death-like slumber. His eyes flutter open wider and wider until he has become the image of a frenzied and manic alertness. In this state, Shazar answers questions from the crowd. Shazar knows every secret held, every secret told and untold. Every answer is pulled from a throat unable to speak of its own, but somehow controlled by his master, the sleeping larynx is willed to function. And in the night, while the town has gone to sleep, Shazar is again awoken by the evil Caligari to murder in the night, while you know wearing this fabulous outfit. Um, of interest to me is the character of Shazar and the sleeping um, voice, the reanimated voice. And when things within the box, or in the case of Caligari, the cabinet, go awry, they are released and they go awry. Um, this idea of the voice box then takes us to the 1950s with the invention of the two-way drive-through speaker box, which originated and was first employed at Jack in the Box at the Jack in the Box drive-through restaurant in Southern California. A sign prepared us for the box reading, Jack will speak to you. It directed drivers to the speaker where they, where they would place their orders. The concept of ordering through a two-way intercom was unfamiliar to many customers in the 1950s, and this panel not only directed customers, but prepared them for the voice of Jack to respond. To help customers with this interaction, a giant clown head springing from a box was employed to better build this idea of who exactly was this Jack within the box. And perhaps most importantly, how the box itself was utilized to displace and occlude issues of front of house and back of house segregation, labor, class in this period of American history. The drive-through and the drive-through speaker interface from which a floating voice of modern magical food relations serves us presents us not only with a site of exchange but a particular choreography or protocol of bodies next to buildings. Bodies next to walls and windows apertures of a specific design for designed interactions. When those interactions go astray, we are left feeling nervous, anxious. What is unfolding and what is happening to me? Similarly, when the interface is broken, so too is the building left in a state of perplexion, having been severed. When that interface is broken, the building is muted. Buildings speak to us, or at least I, I like to think so, or I believe that they can sometimes. The Boca de la Verita, or the Mouth of Truth, is a marble mask in Rome, the legend being that it will bite off the hand of anyone who places their hand into its mouth and tells it a lie. It's made appearances in films and holds this kind of tender mythology of truth-telling and of the building being a kind of truth-teller. With its most likely history placing the mask as a sewer cover in ancient Rome, every year tourists caress, insert, and load this beautiful mouth of a bygone sewage system with this mask of a face, that within that face we read more. We read the, in the face what we desire. So this idea to me is, you know, 
super interesting. It's the facciata parlante, the speaking facade. Um, that surfaces and objects may act as animated conduits for the broadcasting of a deeper narrative and histories of the built environment that remain occluded and sometimes hidden in our everyday surroundings. This, you know, this idea that buildings can, can talk is something that I've been sort of thinking about for, for a while. And so in the next couple of projects, I'm going to sort of distill that into some pedagogy and then some design work. But I want to start with this idea of... Um, if buildings can talk, if buildings are loud speaking, um, how can we tap into that and through the tools of design amplify, remix, dialogue with, and uh, affect and affect that sound. So uh, the first project is um, Rage Warehouse. Um, this project really began um, when I was teaching at MIT and I would walk every day on Mass Ave and see this building that was undergoing, at that point, beginning to undergo demolition. And this is going to be the future site of the School of Architecture at MIT. Um, and at that time, I would walk back and forth every week, um, uh, almost every day in front of this street and sort of look at this building kind of coming apart. And as it was coming apart one day, I looked back and I took a picture of it more to say, uh, and this was an early picture when I was sort of, oh, this building's going to disappear. I should take a picture now. It was already disappearing like further down the street. So I took a picture, put it in my pocket, kept on walking. I opened this up a couple weeks later when I was beginning to sort of think about a syllabus and about investigating this warehouse. And I sort of got this Jenny Holzer perfect moment where it doesn't say storage warehouse, it says rage warehouse. And I thought, hmm, what are you talking about? What, 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 are, you, what are you saying, right? And it says ire proof at the, begin at the bottom, which I thought was even better. Um, and I thought, what has this building, you know, what is the kind of rage that surrounds this building? And what is the proofing uh, towards anger that this building holds. Um, and so this became um, a seminar called Specters of Architecture Investigating Belongings at the Met Warehouse um, at MIT. And what it involved was um, me and a couple students investigating this building. We really took it on as a kind of investigation um, uh, sort of exercise, diving into the archival history of the building and then documenting and being in its real-time demolition and thinking about past, present, and future. The past being a history that we then unearthed about the building and got to know more about. The present being the, the demolition and the kind of current dreams of the building as a school of architecture, and then the future being more speculations about what this building could be, not necessarily its fate as a school of architecture, but rather maybe even deeper into the future as sort of material. Um, you know, the workshop introduced concepts of sound recording, sound design, audio integrated model making, and, and we'll kind of talk a little bit through that. But, you know, some of the things that we unearthed which were really interesting was the history of the Met Warehouse in some of MIT's most radical moments of protest. The anti-war protests of 1969 occurred right on Massachusetts Avenue. And in this film, um, Rick, uh, Ricky Leacock's documentary, November Actions, we spot the Met Warehouse again and again right at the sort of end of a lot of these protests, we spot the warehouse in the background. Um, in a lot of ways, the Met Warehouse is sort of amongst the violent confrontations between students and armed police becomes a witness to these um, really kind of uh, violent moments of conflict, but also um, a witness to a long history of, of protests and a long history of dialogue at MIT that often, I think in some ways, is maybe attributed more to the other side of the street, which is the front of MIT um, proper, or the MIT, where the MIT School of Architecture is, and not to the warehouse, which stands right opposite of that space that is a public plaza, but was, is also, I think, in many ways loaded with being a space of public dissent and public protest. Um, so, you know, students, kind of, we sort of unearthed this history as we started to dig into the past, but we also spent a lot of time with the building in its present and its demolition and documenting its steps and its stages. We um, 
did a lot of sort of conversations with um, the team that was uh, sort of heady, spearheading the demolition. We spent a lot of time documenting the building, being inside of the building repeatedly and as often as we could be because demo happens fast, especially with a project like this that is very much trying to kind of hit a, a sort of institutional uh, marker and deadline. We really had to sort of be in there as much as possible to document the kind of uh, changes that happen from one day to the next. And then sort of working from a macro to a micro. A macro being demo as a kind of space and some students kind of really get, getting a little too close to the fire of some of these things happening, but also the micro finding in the sort of chaos and theater of, of demo these moments of sonic magic or sonic activation, right? The building is coming apart, but the building is also rumbling, it's leaking, it's echoing into its neighborhood. Um, you know, one of the really amazing things that uh, we realized in this demolition process was that as they were literally cutting and slicing the building, they were also flooding the building from the top down and letting water leak throughout the building to stop or to mitigate um, dust. And so, you know, the building is being purposefully turned into this sort of leaking structure. And so we really thought about this uh, project as how can we leak the past and the present into each other through soundscapes. So the project um, ended or the, the seminar culminated in a live performance in the building. The students designed a, a model of the building activated with two speakers, one the past, one the present, one is connected to a microphone so that they're sort of mixing um, live sound, like this was a very analog way to do this, but one is a microphone, so it's the now, and one is a speaker with uh, past recordings, archival recordings, you're going to hear some uh, uh, sounds from protests, you're going to hear um, sounds of the HVAC in the building, all of that leaking water, all of those things kind of coming together. And so we live mixed this uh, on site. Let's listen to a little bit of that. So she's kind of modulating between the, the microphone and then the archival sound and then that resulted a little bit, you can hear it more in this recording. But again, mixing, um, you know, sounds of leaking and uh, dripping some of the kind of protest sounds and then modulating with mostly like HVAC and plumbing and things like this. And the you know review took place sort of ear to the table, um, listening to the vibrations of the model. Um, you know, moving then into some, some more kind of pedagogical examples and, and maybe thinking about, you know, my time at the MIT Department of Architecture was as the Marion Mahoney Fellow, which is research and teaching, right? And finding ways that those things can begin to plug into each other as a creative way to tackle, um, I think, researching and thinking about design in the world. So the sound studio um, was one of those kind of core um, versions of what it meant to sort of explore and output design um, explorations. In the studio, we really focused on introducing, um, again, uh, introducing kind of best practices of sound, um, maybe not sound art, but maybe we could say techniques that are used in sound art, field recording, um, being very meticulous about the way that we archive sounds, record sounds, edit sounds, and thinking about how those things can then plug into the, the world of architectural representation. So the studio focused on um, students picking sites um, sort of near or around the kind of local area around MIT and Cambridge, and then producing a um, sound intervention into a space that would be a public programmed space, so a space that would have a private dwelling for an artist and then a space for public programming. So each project kind of mitigated between private and public, 
loud and quiet and sort of worked between these two things. And so the idea was that how can we completely flip the idea of what an architectural model is? Um, how can we play with it, touch it, interact with it, and how can it live after the studio? So the idea was to also build real live speakers that could then continue to be used after the studio is over and give an afterlife to these objects so that one, they could become objects of representation, but two, objects deployable um, and objects of a certain kind of level of desire and wanting to be around them and wanting to listen to, you know, a playlist at a dinner party at your house on your architectural model. Um, we also spent a lot of time thinking about how to draw sound and how to activate architectural drawings through sound. So we'll listen to a little bit of that now. I really wanted to think about mobility and the moving sound focal point. So for me, the number one kind of reference for that is going to be lowriders in LA. Um, for you know any of you know that are like into car culture, car speaker systems are a whole thing. That is a whole culture, right? And so um, thinking about the kind of the the best, my favorite quality of the lowrider speaker is that you feel it and you hear it before you see it. And by the time you've reached the window to see it, it's gone and it's around the corner, right? This kind of fleeting activation of sound and the way that it interacts with our bodies um, is really um, fascinating to me. So a kind of hybrid between these two things is how I like to think about the Recordar Tower. Um, and thinking about all of the kind of showing offness, thinking about all the theatrics, the kind of um, really just like stunting that is attached with a, a lot of these systems. And then frontality, we talked about face today, right? The sort of reading in the face what we desire. Um, in, in some ways personifying or loading objects with a kind of faceness and then a kind of characterness, right? So cars is like a number one um, example of this, right? Being um, a, a kid, I mean, I always remember looking at headlights and thinking that they were eyes, right? The association between the face and a kind of character becoming really important and thinking about that interaction between faces um, being a, a kind of place for play. Um, and so, you know, in, in, let's think maybe about architectural faciality and architectural form on one end, and then on the other, sound as a way to kind of begin to disintegrate how we, how we read objects. Um, I really love this quote from Fred Moten who talks about, sound gives us back the visuality that ocular centrism has repressed. So being able to interact with objects in, with other senses. Um, Recordar is what the kind of project takes on as its sort of terminology for what it does. Recordar, it's a little bit of a play on words, right? So in Spanish, it means two things. It means to record, but also to remember. And um, this is a quote from one of my favorite writers, Eduardo Galeano, um, an Uruguayan writer who writes, Recordar, to remember from the Latin records, to pass back through the heart. And I, I love this idea that um, in listening, we are both kind of split in two ways, right? We're listening and we're listening to something that is oftentimes recorded and happened already as in the past, but it's a purely in the moment action. And so past and present completely sort of collide in, in, in this act of listening. So the sound tower began with the idea of a place where you could record things that were happening and layer past events that had happened in the same space. So I started with this idea of a kind of table in which I recorded myself having 11 different meals and then overlapping them over each other and thinking about the way that past and, and, and present can kind of overlap. Um, so the idea originally took the form of an idea of multiple towers that would come together and create a sort of um, space for sitting and performing, that these towers would be each enabled with a sound system that could record and broadcast so that it could then record itself. Um, that idea then gave way to thinking about a tower as an object that could really be um, 
used as this modular and moving point for, for sound and then beginning to ideate on what that tower could be and what its different arrangements could produce. Um, and really ultimately going to the nervous system, a sonic nervous system for this object that is based on recording and broadcasting simultaneously. So these were some of the early models and kind of beginning to think about different arrangements. You know, could we put multiples of these together and create a sound wall or a kind of almost like a stage for performance? You know, could they be dispersed and sort of produce niches for listening? Um, and we also tested uh, one of the big things that we tested was sensors and kind of activating these things um, with proximity sensors to each other. Um, and then the kind of configuration of a black box theater or a kind of table, a super scale table where you could record events. Um, yeah, if we could hear that, <laughs> you would kind of hear these models reacting to each other um, and the sound of one model being able to trigger um, a loop in another model. So as they got together, they began to loop and loop more and create a fuzzier and fuzzier boundary of noise. Um, you know, moving from that project, the next move was to build one. And so this is what um, was built for Exhibit Columbus, a sound tower that could be um, mobile and that could be activated through uh, recording and broadcasting simultaneously. Um, we, we moved it the night that we moved it from the MIT sort of fabrication space to the Keller Gallery. We had to walk that mass avenue sort of <laughs> street and it was at this point like almost midnight and I looked across the street and the gas station across the street was just lit so beautifully and you know with our students we hadn't, we had just disassembled this and we're about to test assembling it in the gallery and we said I think we could assemble this in under 10 minutes. And so we sound tested in the gas station because it was the perfect place to kind of <laughs> test the sound system at its loudest. It was about to go in a gallery space where we couldn't be that loud. So we assembled it at the gas station, tested the sound system, and then installed it in the gallery. Um, so this is the, the kind of some gallery shots of the kind of early versions of the, of the work. It has some vibrational speakers in the lower levels. And uh, one of the first performances with Nicole uh, Lihulier, who is an um, amazing vocal and sonic artist. Um, so Responder is the form that this takes at Exhibit Columbus. Responder is the name of the performance that um, this tower uh, took part of for three months in uh, Columbus, Indiana. It takes place at the Columbus Public Library and the core of the project is how could you program a wavelength? How can we think about a wavelength as um, a, a kind of um, catalyst for when people gather and when people don't gather around something, right? How can it in some ways be the sort of programming system for a space? Um, it took the place uh, then of installing this tower in the sunken courtyard of the Cleo Rogers Memorial Library designed by IMP. Um, and the site was really interesting. It's sunken, so it's below the ground. Um, and then we have this incredible acoustic, like it acts as like an acoustic waffle. It really pulled the sound from the tower. So the tower has a subwoofer that's angled towards the ground from the back. So it sends sound into the ground and then up, it travels up this sort of like atrium overhang space and it like that waffle really acts like a kind of sonic cone and pushes the sound back down into the courtyard, which ended up being a really beautiful um, kind of collaboration between the building and the tower in producing amplified sound. The sound came from a series of recordings that I did. I also did a couple of recordings with some of the librarians and even you know, got like a, a volunteer or two that ended up doing recordings with me. We connected uh, mics to anything and everything in the building. Plants, rails, pipes for water that went to the water fountains. The really hot one was the AC system. I mean, this building has two different AC systems. One um, that was extremely loud and kind of, you know, rumbled. Another one that's really quiet and kind of hissed. So kind of finding all these registers in the building, um, vibrations in the windows from rain, all kinds of sounds. And there was also construction happening across the street, which ended up being another source for um, 
sound, and then you have all of the kind of life around the building. We um, buried microphones to get some lower register kind of vibrational sound under the ground, um, the sound of cicadas, the sound of birds, and all of these things mixed ultimately into a 15 minute long um, track. And the idea was that you know the building would inhale for seven minutes in the morning and then exhale for seven minutes in the evening. Um, and then that later kind of oscillated throughout the process um, where I think ultimately we ended up at 15 minutes. So we would inhale for 15 minutes at sunrise, exhale for 15 minutes at sunset. And really treating that kind of courtyard space as a sound bath right, that you would descend into this courtyard and the sound would get deeper and more rumbling and, and really kind of hold space in that, um, in that courtyard. Um, and you know, uh, I think it really became a beautiful moment of negotiation between the building, which is a library where sound is not necessarily um, the thing that you want, uh, versus a, a project that's really about amplifying the sound that's already there, right? These sounds are already occurring. Every day the building shifts and, and, and creaks and, and rumbles and vibrates. And really the, you know, the interest um, for me was that this building is really such an example of resource architecture. It's, a, it's such a resource for the community. Buildings have been a resource for me my entire life, right? As a place of, of not only education, but care, right? It was a place of child care for my family when I was growing up. Um, and really, it's such a resource for the community. It's doing work, right? Like buildings are a great example of architecture that does work continuously and consistently. And that kind of, ex the kind of exchange that often happens is one that I think uh, maybe plugs itself more into an idea of the library as an extension of government or um, you know, the library as an extension of a kind of civic relationship versus the library really being a place that is for the people and a place that is for sheltering and caring of both our minds and our kind of, you know, maybe a sort of intellectual exchange with the resources in the library, but it's also bodily, right? And so my goal was that we would listen to this building a little more closely and maybe reevaluate our relationship to it. Um, now the, the, the project has moved and was installed today um, in New York and it's going to be a part of a series of, of public programmings at Lycan, which is a kind of design hub. Um, I'll end really quickly with a last project. Um, this is more of a sneak peek, um, if anything. Um, it's a project that has been kind of, it's, we're in the weeds. It's developing right now. It's barely kind of coming to life. But the idea is that in many ways what has interested me about sound and sound objects, in particular sound systems, is that they're big, they're bad, they're heavy. And that doesn't have to be literal, it can be sonic, right? But sound kind of presence has all of these qualities just as much as form. And so for me, there's a really incredible dialogue between the way that we might employ how we listen to sound and the effect that it has on us and the way that we can think about that in terms of space as well. So this is a co collaboration between me and um, Joseph Zeal Henry, who is one of the, the creators of Sound Advice, which is a London-based um, social justice organization. Um, and working with um, a graphic designer, Lauren Harewood, on this project. Sound Advice has a pretty you know, deep history of sort of working around sound and um, social justice issues through graphics and through um, kind of, you know, these sort of short and punchy um, methods towards critique, uh, specifically critique in architecture. And how do we bring these two organizations, one that is really about um, a kind of uh, activism, sound as a, as a place for resistance, and an interest in sound through um, architectural methods of making things and making big things, making public things, making things that are for a kind of um, communal end, right, or a kind of communal goal. Um, and so, and how do we kind of build culture around that? How do we build culture around these moments of architectural, um, like, blossoming or being? So, Super System has been born, or it's being born, it's in the process of being born. Um, it's uh, uh, going to be a kind of public, communal uh, sound system that can be utilized by um, different um, 
for different events, community building playlists is a big um, sort of work that uh, Sound Advice has been doing for years. But it begins here. The project begins with a, a billboard. So Sound Advice, one of their earliest projects that they did when they were beginning as an organization was to hire out a couple billboards to produce graphics that were um, both in a kind of place um, between art and activism. And so the billboard really became a kind of driving force behind the project, thinking about this object that is such a capitalist vessel and is so severely engineered, right? It's, it's a really intense object um, made to hold so, so very little often. Um, and, and thinking about the billboard and maybe could we crack it open and think about it as a theatrical move. Think about the billboard and its interior being able to become suddenly a stage, become a place for holding togetherness, becoming a place for holding sound. Um, this is a, a, a scene from uh, Paul Schrader's Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, which is a great movie and the kind of set design is insane. But the idea of like cracking, over, cracking open something that has no substance and extracting from it the possibility for deep and, and sort of um, beautiful togetherness is maybe a kind of um, desire of the project to subvert the billboard and find in it an opportunity for being together. So this is the project um, in maybe some of its modular configurations. It can open to 60 feet wide at its longest when it's in full billboard mode, and then it closes up in this sort of triangle configuration when it's um, active and, and everywhere in between, right, in those arrangements to become a stage, to become a, a kind of column for sound, and then these speaker boxes plug into it. Um, and, you know, and the power of, of multiple arrangements, being able to play, we've been playing with um, fabric and thinking about how do we clad this system, how do we protect it and shelter it um, the way you would a body, also kind of tearing apart the idea of the billboard as a single surface um, sort of condition, and then being able to kind of flip the, or, or hinge these panels to be able to create multiple configurations and multiple possibilities of using it as a space for sound. Um, you know, I'll kind of end on this image. It, it's sort of a, maybe the, the project at its most um, hopeful and speculative, bringing together the echoes of a, of a um, you know, object that we all know fairly well, the billboard, it's kind of iconography, it's um, in some ways maybe it's kind of sacrilegious capitalist um, history or existence, the sound cabinet kind of floating in the, in the back of our minds, the sound cabinet, and, and here this one being a very specific sound cabinet designed by Noah Purifoy to be a, a beautiful community center point. Um, and then our project kind of floating somewhere in the middle, a place for togetherness, a place that challenges some of the things that again, we may not love about the world, but how can we find in our tools as designers, ways to first identify those things that we don't love and change them. And in that action, maybe perhaps find an avenue towards loving the world um, in our own way. And so, you know, I think today in the middle of everything that's happening, the greatest thing that we could do is listen. And um, I, I, well, I'll just end today with a, a very short quote from Pauline Oliveros, an amazing sound artist, prolific, and perhaps at the kind of core of everything that I've shown today, who says, um, hearing is unavoidable, listening is a choice. And I think that um, it's one of the most powerful things that we could do is to listen and find in those spaces of listening opportunities to connect with each other, to protect each other, to give care to each other. Um, even if we sometimes don't know how, listening can be the first and most important step.